All right. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's about 8.15 on April the 16th, 2021. And thank you all for being here. Uh, you all know I'm Vice President Raj Dixon of the SVAS, and tonight's lecture is Telescopes, Your Window on the Cosmos. Let's do a slideshow. There you are, and I trust everyone can see that, yes? All right. So, uh, I trust everyone can see it, yes? Someone, someone please unmute and answer. Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so here we are. That's what we're gonna be talking about. Telescopes, their history and function. So what are telescopes and what do they do? Uh, Marion Webster tells us that a telescope is a usually tubular optical instrument for viewing distant objects by means of the refraction of light rays through a lens or the reflection of light rays by a concave mirror. They should have said parabolic, but they're Marion Webster, they're not specialized in astronomy. Any of various tubular magnifying optical instruments. From the new Latin word telescopium, originally from the Greek telescopos, uh, I think it's telescopos, far-seeing from tele and scopos, uh, far-seeing watcher, and from the Greek scopine to look. So how do these things work? And what are the different types? Let's first explain how magnification itself works. When you look through a simple microscope or magnifying glass, with a biconvex lens, which I'm circling with my cursor, uh, is bent like the back of the spoon on both sides. The object being viewed, whatever you're looking at, here, this example is a bunch of leaves or a flower, is on the far side of the lens. The parallel rays of light emanating, or well, the sun's rays in this case, uh, the light coming from this object reaches the lens and gets refracted or bent through the lens. And it reaches this focal point right at your eye's lens here. And then it proceeds to your retina. Now the angle is, I believe it's called subtended. The way it works is instead of your eyes, if there were no lens here, the parallel rays of light would enter your eye and be focused. And the angle of incidence uh, would give you a one X image or it would appear life-sized. But through the use of the lens, your eye is actually tracking the, Im the virtual image. See how the rays of light, imagine them extending out to this virtual image, okay? And it gives your brain the impression that you're looking at a much bigger object. Since the virtual image is farther away from your eyes, uh, the object appears to be bigger. And that's how magnification works in a nutshell. So the first and oldest type of telescope is the refractor. And there's the uh, basic diagram of the optical path of a refractor, uh, the lens-based telescope. The oldest type of telescope invented by Hans Lippershey in 1608 or so, he couldn't obtain a patent for whatever reason. Galileo built his own refractor in 1609 and started studying the skies. Galileo's most powerful telescope had a, was about three foot three and had a fixed magnification of 30 because it had a fixed eyepiece. Because of the crew technology of the time, uh, it had a very narrow field of view, its images were blurry and distorted. It was still good enough, however, for Galileo to see the craters on the moon, to find the four largest moons of Jupiter, which are Io, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto, which we still call the Galilean moons, and he was able to observe the phases of Venus. That's uh, Lippershey, that's Galileo. And this uh, is a museum in Florence, Italy, where two of Galileo's original scopes are still preserved to this day. And this is, that's 412, 412 years. I don't know if I'm gonna be in that good, of, good of, of shape in 412 years, but I'm working on it. Now here's how a refractor works. At the front of the refractor is called the objective, uh, the main lens. And that's what determines the aperture. So if you have a, a 
the, for many years, the classical, the classic amateur instrument was a 60 millimeter or 2.4 inch refractor, meaning it had a 60 millimeter lens. I have uh, two refractors, a 90 millimeter and 120 millimeter, which are three and a half and 4.7 inches uh, respectively. The objective takes the light from the star, moon, planet, whatever you're looking at, refracts or bends it, comes here to the focal point, and then the eyepiece, whatever eyepiece you use, is a crude magnifying glass, which magnifies the image okay, from the focal point of the scope. That's my uh, little achromatic telescope. It's a simple achromatic doublet, three and a half inches. That's my grab and go scope. I use it for school star parties or public functions. When we have public functions, we haven't had one for quite a while. Uh, sadly, but we'll get back to it soon. That was a Christmas gift to myself in 2017. This is my Skywatcher 120 millimeter apochromatic doublet made out of ED enhanced dispersion glass on a Stellar View M2 mount. So what's the difference between achromatic and apochromatic? Uh, as you can see here, the achromatic lens is what's called a doublet. It has a crown and a flint. And it this helps to correct the inherent color error of a, of a refractor telescope, which we're going to get to. Uh, the first refractor, like Galileo's, had just one lens, one convex lens, and that creates a severe color fringing. The achromatic, uh, adding a, a, a second concave flint uh, glass, helps reduce color error. And the modern ap apochromatic, which has either two or three lens elements, made of a much higher quality glass, enhanced dispersion or fluorite glass, almost reduces color fringing to nil, but you pay a price for it. They're very expensive. In fact, uh, a good high quality refractor is the most expensive type of telescope per inch of aperture. And we're going to address the pros and cons of every design uh, and the flaws of refractors and reflectors and, and whatever a little bit later. Just keep in mind that the classic problem of the refractor is the color fringing or chromatic aberration, which is the fancy word for it. So the second type of the telescope is uh, the reflecting telescope. And this is a sketch, a simple diagram of the basic plan of the Newtonian reflector. Mirror-based, not lens-based. And unlike a refractor where you're looking at the back of it, you're looking up near the front of it here, as, as we will see. Now the first reflectors were invented by Sir Isaac Newton. And that's Sir Isaac Newton. And beware, that's not Sir Isaac Newton. So don't be fooled by cheap knockoffs. Reflectors are the second oldest type of telescope. They were invented by Newton in 1668 because of the chromatic aberration problems caused by refractors. Here's original Newtonian. We had a two inch mirror and had a six and a quarter inch focal length and had a magnification of 35. Again, due to its fixed, basically fixed eyepiece. And the mirror was not made out of glass, it was made out of metal because ref reflective glass uh, of uh, with the quality to reflect enough light wouldn't be common until a hundred years later. So these mirrors were, these mirrors were speculum metal, a blend of uh, tin and copper and antimony. Now the reflecting telescope solves the false color problem, but it introduces other problems as we're going to see. Here is how the Newtonian works. The light from the galaxy, planet or whatever is coming in, parallel rays. This is a parabolic mirror. mirror. So the curvature is parabolic and that curvature focuses the incoming light as it bounces off toward a secondary smaller mirror near the front of the telescope the secondary mirror is a simple flat mirror, just like the mirror in your bathroom, although of a higher polish, and it bounces the image into the eyepiece, which is up front. That's a replica of Newton's uh, original refractor, or one of his original refractors. It had a ball alt azimuth mount. There's the fixed eyepiece, and the, at the back is a two inch mirror. Now here is a, a modern day Newtonian, or what they call Dobsonian scope. The term Dobsonian comes from John Dobson, Sacramento's own John Dobson, who invented not the telescope, because it's still a Newtonian optical design, 
John Dobson invented this mount, this uh, almost cannon mounting, where you place the, the tube, the optical tube on this base, and you can go up and down, left and right, on nearly a lazy Susan type bottom, and thus have a cheap, simple way of uh, mounting a big tube and moving it manually. And now they've added motors and guidance systems, but the originals were all manual. And it's much more stable than a tripod, okay, which is the way they used to be mount, the way they used to mount uh, these telescopes. And these can be had for roughly $400 still. Now, my first scope when I got back into this hobby in 2015 was this exact Orion XT8 Classic. I grew up with a six inch Newtonian, the one that my father made. He bought the uh, kit from, I think it was Edmund Scientific with a, he got a six inch black mirror that he was able to grind and polish, bought a sono tube, uh, tube assembly and put it together himself, but it was on an equatorial mount. This is far more user friendly, especially for beginners. Uh, that I had aperture fever pretty early on after that eight inch. So I upgraded to this uh, 10 inch push to Dobsonian, a little bit more expensive, but it did have setting, digital setting circles, which would help guide me uh, to a target. Although you st I still have to do all the pushing and pulling manually. There was no motorized. Uh, this does have motorized functions because eventually the 10 inch wasn't enough. Although it got me through the Herschel 400 and the Messier catalog. Uh, so the Orion, this is my trust Opsonian, uh, the Orion 16 inch. There's a 16 inch primary mirror. Uh, it's expensive scope, but I got it on sale. Brand new, would be almost 4,000. I was able to get it plus a large number of accessories for 3,000 as, uh, as I was able to get it used, very suddenly used from a dealer down in Orange County. It's a beast, it's six foot one and 200 pounds. It's bigger than I am. Uh, and here, here's a dream scope. That's a 32 inch Dobsonian. Uh, it has full motorization, full on go-to with, uh, and it has the Nexus digital setting circles, which are pretty much the best you can get. It costs as much as a modest car or a small SUV, uh, but the views through it can be life-changing. That gives you a little scale as to uh, what you're looking at. So, yeah, you need a ladder to look through that, that baby. Because the eyepiece, there's the focuser. Uh, and there's my short self. So the third type of telescope is the compound, also known as the Cassegrain or catadioptric scope. Uh, there is the uh, basic, basic design. It's called folding the light path, which we'll discuss soon. It's the most recent type of design. In 1672, the French astronomer Laurent Cassegrain, uh, or as we mangle it in English, Cassegrain, but Laurent Cassegrain, I couldn't find an image of him no matter how much I searched, invented it, basically a new type of, of reflector, the Cassegrain reflector. The secondary convex mirror is suspended above a primary mirror, a primary concave mirror. Now, why, why this complexity? And you may notice the primary mirror has a hole in the center. Light enters, hits the concave mirror, which bends it toward the secondary. The secondary has a different curvature. It's not flat like a Newtonian. It, it also has stone curvature. And that it again focuses the light and sends it back again through the hole in the primary to the eyepiece back then it would have been an eyepiece in modern days it could be an eyepiece or it could be a camera back here at, at the rear of the scope now why something so complicated this folded light path in almost out then back it increases the focal length of the scope and it increases magnification uh, these were originally designed for planetary use and when you're looking at the planets jupiter mars saturn especially you want more magnification they can take it, they're bright, and you want to see more detail. And this design does provide increased magnifying power. Now, 
the drawback is you lose a you lose width in your field of view, but you can't have everything. And uh, certain modified designs of the basic cast of grain idea are the ideal uh, for astrophotography. Uh, soon after the cast of grain came the Schmidt cast of grain, originally derived from the Schmidt camera by Bernhard Schmidt in 1930. He was a German Estonian optici optician. There is a the primary mirror of the Schmidt Cassegrain is spherical, which is pretty easy to make. The, the front of the tube is not open the way it is in other scopes, but there is a corrector lens there. It's a Schmidt corrector plate, and it does bend the incoming light a bit, takes it to the, to the spherical mirror, which puts it out, will it back up halfway to the secondary mirror, and uh, instead of the secondary mirror, you can put a camera, or in the old days, they'd put uh, a, a film right there, whatever kind of detector you want, film or electronic camera these days, at the prime focus, which is right here. It allows for very fast focal ratios, meaning you can get quicker exposures or a better image in a quicker exposure, and it helps to control coma and astigmatism. So again, here is a more detailed examination of the schmidt cassegrain design. Well, actually, this is, this is the schmidt cassegrain telescope. Previously, I was talking about the Schmidt camera. So again, a spherical primary mirror, a Schmidt corrector plate, and a convex secondary mirror, which flattens the field. Okay, the image from the, the light from the galaxy or planet or whatnot comes in, hits the primary, hits the curve secondary, and gets bent again back through the, there's always a hole in the center of the primary in a schmidt cassegrain and your camera or eyepiece is back here. Uh, Celestron is very famous for their orange tube and their HD scopes. Uh, this was a, unfortunately they don't make these anymore. They now are called LX65, but this was the old Mead Light Switch 8, an eight inch uh, schmidt cassegrain design. There you can see it's, not open, there is the, there's a corrector plate, the eight inch mirror is back there, there's a secondary mirror, but you look through the back end. This is called the light switch because it has it had built in GPS and a built in uh, homing system. So you didn't have to align on bright stars. You literally just flipped a switch and waited and it would uh, align itself and beep when it was ready. That's the Hubble Space Telescope which is also a type of compound telescope. It's a Rishi Chrétien design, the invention of uh, American George Ritchie and French astronomer Henri Chrétien. Uh, it's a specialized type of compound, a Cassegrain scope. The primary mirror is a, has a hyperbolic curve, which is not the easiest or the cheapest thing to make. And the secondary mirror also has a hyperbolic curve. This eliminates off-axis off coma and the, op the optical aberration of coma. So the Ritchie has a wider field of view uh, without op the optical errors compared to a traditional reflecting telescope. Most of the large telescopes in the world today, like the Subaru telescope in Hawaii, the Hubble, use this uh, Ritchie Chrétien design. So what are the pros and cons of each design? And Looks like oops, I'm sorry. Um apologize for that, a little technical glitch. Refractors have the sharpest images of any scope. And the best apos, they look like uh TV in 4K or even 8K if they're good enough. And a lot of you will remember the days before HD TV. You'll remember standard, standard definition television. And think of the difference between standard definition and high definition. Well, a good refractor is high definition. They're perfect for the moon, for planets, for double stars, and for getting started in astrophotography. The classic first astrophotographer's scope is an 80 millimeter F6 refractor, fairly short focal length. 
but they are the most affordable. The mo they are the most expensive per inch for ap for apochromatics. Achromatics are relatively affordable. They can be good starter scopes. Uh, Newtonian reflectors, and most Newtonians you buy these days are Dobsonians. There are still a few newts that come on tripods, but the vast majority of newts these days are Dobsonians. The biggest bang for your buck. They're affectionately known as light buckets. They're what you want if you want to see distant galaxies, faint nebulae, if you want to see uh, star clusters, with, uh, and you want to see them you know, not on video or not on camera, but you want to see them with your own eyes through an eyepiece, you get yourself a big Dobsonian. They can be heavy, they can be awkward, especially once they're in double digit figures. The eight inch that I showed had a total weight of about 42 pounds. The, uh, the tube, the scope itself was 21, the base was 21. The 10 inch was 56 pounds, basically 28 for the tube, 28 for the base. And as I mentioned, the 16 inch daub was two, is 200 pounds and they can be very heavy and bulky. They're visual tools, and they're not meant for photography. Compounds are priced somewhere in the middle. They're generally portable and versatile. They can be for visual or astrophotography. In my experience, they're not nearly as sharp as refractors. I find the image in most uh, compounds, and I've looked through the Mead ACF. Uh, I've looked through a Richie Chrétien. I don't find them to be as sharp as refractors or even a well-collimated daub, and they don't pull in as much light as daubs either. I will say that the, the Celestron HD, Edge HD SCTs, they are remarkably sharp, at least the ones I've looked through. Now here's the, the curse of the refractor, chromatic aberration. Note the color fringing around the moon. And this was absolutely horrible in the first refractors. You'd have gotten almost a full on rainbow around the moon. Here, even in a modern achromatic refractor, uh, you still get on very bright objects, a uh, slight blue fringe. I've also seen slight purple and gold fringing. This is an exaggerated, overly magnified, but even on Jupiter, you can get blue and other multicolored fringing. Now what's going on? Why is this happening? Well, if you remember, I, going back to Isaac Newton, he did the famous experiment with a prism. He passed white sunlight through a prism and white light is not pure white light. White light is actually a mixture of every color on the spectrum. When white light is passed through a prism, it breaks up into its constituent parts, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Take a look at, at a lens. Look at the top and the bottom. Recognize anything? It basically has a prismatic effect. When white light comes in, it gets bent, and it bends, it's, it breaks up the light from the star or the sun or the planet into its, into its constituent colors. And that's the source of chromatic aberration. That's what was noticed by Galileo. Uh, that's what drove Isaac Newton to invent the reflector because although colors don't bend evenly, they all do reflect evenly. So chromatic aberration is the curse of the cheap refractor or the early refractor. The Newtonian eliminates that problem. And this is a, out of kind of a fuzzy image. It had to be overly magnified to fuzziness to get, to get the photo. But here you can see a five inch Jupiter, five inch achromat, see a blue fringe, an achromatic, as opposed to a six inch Newtonian where uh, maybe not quite as sharp as the achromatic, but there's absolutely no false color when you have a Newtonian. And here's what an apochromatic, a teleview, a stellar view, or other makers of apochromatic scopes, and Skywatcher, Explore Scientific, they also make apochromatic scopes. Uh, Takahashi, perhaps uh, world-renowned for its apochromatic scopes, for, uh, especially for astrophotography and imaging. This is what an APO can do at its best. You can take images like this, and when you're looking through a good aphromatic on a good night, you literally see the, si the stars as diamonds on black velvet. It's a cliche, but on the right night with a good aphromatic, you, you really think you are seeing diamonds on black velvet. It, the sharpness, crystal clear images through, through a good quality refractor, 
There's nothing like it. Now the Newtonian. The curse of the, of the Newtonian is what's called coma. Take a look at the stars in this photo. You'll notice how they're distorted, how they appear almost like comets, hence the term coma. Uh, this is the optical aberration that's inherent in a Newtonian. Okay. Uh, coma has to be, uh, can be corrected for by a special corrector lens, but coma happens because even though colors reflect reflect evenly, so you don't have any color fringing, still all the rays of light bouncing off a mirror can't quite come to the to the same focal point off a parabolic mirror. And the longer the focal length of your Newtonian, the less coma you have, and the wider central field of view you'll have with no coma. But in the modern short Newtonians, you know, big aperture, but you want to keep your feet on the ground, F3, F4, and so forth, you only have a very sweet spot, a small sweet spot without coma, and everything outside that sweet spot is going to suffer from coma. So that's why tele, Teleview invented the Paracore. There are other cheaper coma corrections you can buy that re reduce this error uh, by adding an extra lens that increases the focal length and makes the st stars more pinpoint. Now, here's a, we're going to talk about the vast difference briefly between what you see in a scope and what you see on TV. This is the uh, famous Whirlpool Galaxy, Messier object number 51 in the constellation Canis Venatici. It's a beautiful grand design spiral galaxy with a smaller galaxy held in thrall gravitationally. Just a, an amazing object. And it's getting higher and higher in the sky every day because right now the Big Dipper right after dark is ascending in the sky. And so if you wait a few hours after sunset, uh, this is fairly high in the sky. It's like moving into prime viewing for this particular galaxy. That's what Hubble sees. Hubble took that photo. Now, if you're looking through a modest telescope, say at six to eight inch, maybe even a 10 inch at low to medium mag, say between 50, 75 X, you're not going to see this. You're going to see this. That is a, almost exactly what I saw <laughs> the first time I spied the Whirlpool in my 10 inch. And I, I was using low mag, I think in the 60s, because uh, I was just, I wanted a wide field of view, I was sweeping. Yep, and it's a far cry from Hubble. Now, if you have good aperture, 10 or more, or even, even eight inches might be enough. If you have a very clear, dark sky, and you bump up the magnification to 125, 150 plus, you can see this. You can make out spiral arms in the Whirlpool Galaxy. You need a good, clean, dark sky, and you need uh, sufficient aperture, and you need to bump up your mag to at least, at least 100, and probably better off with 125, 150. But you can see spiral, uh, spiral arms, and at Black Butte, which is up uh, north of, uh, west of Chico. In my 16 inch at about 150 mag on a very cl clear dark night out there, I not only saw the spiral arms looking a little brighter than this, I even detected just a faint hint of blue. So it is possible, but uh, don't be fooled by all the images you see in, on science shows uh, and on scientific websites showing you Hubble images, images taken through massive massive uh, ground-based telescopes and observatories. They're beautiful and they're real for what they are. They're scientifically made or even, even well-made amateur photos. Those are taken by very fancy cameras with hours of exposure time, uh, using computer chips thousands of times more sensitive to light than the eyes can be, our eyes ever could be. So when you look through a telescope visually, you're not gonna see what you see on TV. But at least for me, I find that more rewarding because I still am thrilled by the fact that when I see this, I'm seeing something that, I'm seeing a photon that left that source 23 million years ago. Kind of helps put things in perspective, my two cents. And uh, here's something. 
you're not going to see this in a refractor. This requires a big daub. Uh, that's Quasar 3C273, the brightest quasar, easiest one to see in a telescope. It's almost 3 billion light years away. And quasar stands for quasi-stellar object. Uh, it's believed that quasars are the light emanated from supermassive black holes at the early stages of galaxies from the early universe. That's why so many of them are so far away. It looks stellar. It only looks like a small point of light, even in a, even in a 16 inch but it's pretty faint and you're not gonna see it in a small scope. Now, here's where the uh, schmidt cassegrain design shines. It's very good for, for photography. This is an amateur photograph uh, taken of Jupiter, taken with a 14 inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. You can see Jupiter, its bands, even its cloud formations, two of its Galilean moons, and even the shadow this moon here is casting a shadow. And note you can see the moon as spears and not as mere pinpoints of light. So all three designs have their strengths and weaknesses. All three have their specific uses. Now it's time for some telescope math. Okay, yes. Don't panic. This is not this is not advanced math, but it's just simple math. Beginners often ask. And the star parties, I'm often asked, wow, what's the power of your telescope? And my answer is, well, what power do you want it to be? Because the telescope's power, in other words, its magnification, is calculated by taking the telescope's focal length and dividing by the focal length of the eyepiece you're using. So when you go to a department store and you see some small three-inch refractor, you know, which has a, a Hubble photograph on it of some galaxy in full color, implying that you would actually see that and bragging 600X, that's nonsense. A telescope's power depends upon the eyepiece. It's not a built-in fixed quantity, except of course for Galileo and Newton, their original scopes, because they had a fixed built-in eyepiece that couldn't be swapped out. Focal lengths in, refractor, in refractors and reflectors are pretty straightforward. In compounds, they're longer because of the folded light path. So F ratio is calculated by taking the focal length of a scope and dividing by its aperture. You remember my little maroon 90 millimeter acromat. The focal length was 660 millimeters. So the F ratio is 660 divided by 90, because three and a half inches is 90 millimeters, F 7.3. Uh, my Skywatcher 120 APO has a focal length of 900, an aperture of 120, uh, which is 4.72 inches. 900 divided by 120 is f7.5. It's a little bit longer or slower than the Acromat. My Orion X-T8 and the X-T10, they both had a 1200 millimeter focal length, but the apertures are different. So their F ratios are different. For the eight inch, 1200 divided by 203, eight inches is 203 millimeters, is f5.9. Uh, the 10 incher is 1200 divided by 254, which is 10 inches and in millimeters, F4.7. So the eight inch Orion is longer or slower than the 10 inch, which was shorter or faster. Okay. That eight inch light switch I showed you has a focal length of 2000 because the light comes in, bounces back to the front, then bounces back to the rear again. So the total focal length is 2000. It's eight incher, so its aperture is 203 millimeters. So it's F10, 2000 divided by 203 is basically 10. My 16 inch has a focal length of 1800 because it's a long scope. And we, when I use a coma corrector, it increases it to 1980. So the focal ratio, not a ratio, sorry, ratio is 1800 divided by 406, which is 16 inches in millimeters. It's an F4.4. The coma corrector makes it 4.87. Now, if you remember the pictures of the XT8 and the XT10, the eight was slimmer. They're both the same length, but the 10 is wider because of the greater aperture. Fast and slow came from the old days of photography. A faster scope takes an image of an object more quickly than a slower scope, but the slower scope makes a, a larger image because it has greater magnification. Slower scopes have a narrower field of view, but tend to be a little bit sharper. Faster scopes can have a wider field of view, but you have to be careful because they're more prone to optical aberrations. 
Aperture is the most important feature of a scope, and especially for visual observers, because the more aperture you have, the deeper into the universe you see, because you're gathering more light. An eight inch telescope gathers four times as much light as a four inch scope, uh, not twice as much. Now, why is that the case? Well, think of uh, tiles. Think of a one by one floor tile, one foot by one foot, one square foot. Now think of a two foot by two foot floor tile. Is that two square feet? No, it's four square feet. Think of a three foot by three foot tile. It's not three square feet, it's nine square feet. And even though we're talking about uh, curves here, basically uh, more or less circular elements, still the area of a circle is pi r squared. So the uh, square relationship is maintained. So an eight-inch telescope doesn't gather twice as much light as a four-inch. It's uh, two squared or four times as much light. And a 32-inch gathers 64 times as much light as a four-inch because 32 divided by four is eight. Eight squared is 64. My 16-inch gathers four times more than my old eight-inch and 2.56 times more than my old 10-inch. That's 16 divided by 10 is 1.6. 1.6 squared is 2.56. I've had some people ask me, well, since Dobbs are the biggest bang for your buck, my first scope should be a 12 inch. I've had people tell me, see my 16 inch and tell me, that's gonna be my first scope, that's 16 inch. Uh, can you lift that much? Like I said, the 10 incher was a 56 pound scope. And can you lift that much? Can you fit it into your car? Especially if you want passengers? I, I bought a minivan because I knew I was getting that 16 incher. And it does break down to separate parts, the truss poles and base, they all break down into parts. But still it's a load and I can, I can fit, I have to fold down all the second and third rows to get all my gear in there. At least I can have one passenger. I used to have a small Chevrolet Cruze and I could fit my 10 incher in there and all my gear, but I was not, I couldn't have a front seat passenger, it would just be me. For decades, the standard amateur scope was a 60 millimeter or 2.4 inch refractor, as I mentioned. And that's still a good scope for looking at the moon, planets, and double stars, especially if you live in a light polluted area. But for a starter scope, I'd recommend a four inch refractor or an eight inch daub. Uh, the refractor really has the advantage that you don't have to collimate it. Uh, Dobsonians, Newtonians, you have to collimate because they have two mirrors, the primary and the secondary. Those mirrors have to be in alignment. The alignment process is called collimation. If they're not in alignment, you'll get a terrible image and you'll lose uh, a lot of your light gathering capacity. Refractors, unless you hit them really hard, they're basically no maintenance required for the most part. Uh, and they tend to be a four inch refractor. It's a pretty light, easy, easy scope. My three and a half inch acro acromat I can pick up the scope and the tripod, the whole thing, and carry it in one fell swoop easily. I could even one hand it sometimes. Uh, small Schmidt Cassegrains like the C8 or, oops, they're portable and they often come with go to mounts as well. Now, when it comes to eyepieces and how they work with telescopes, we're going to use this 10 millimeter Plossel eyepiece for our first examples. This is a basic eyepiece that comes provided with many telescopes, starter scopes. Even, uh, even the 10 inch uh, Orion comes with a, uh, a 10 millimeter Plossel and a 25 as well. So do the math. In my little Maru 90 millimeter, this eyepiece would give me 66 mag, 660 over 10. In my Skywatcher, it would, be, it would give me 90 mag. In both the eight inch and 10 inch Orion daubs, it would give me 120 mag. So your telescope's power isn't fixed. It depends on what eyepiece. In that Meet LS8, you'd get 200 mag. In my 16 inch, it'd be 180 without a coma corrector, 198 with the coma corrector. The higher mags uh, provided by refractors uh, vary because refractors are usually slow. Use, most of my refractors are over F7, but they're entry level and wide field or rich field refractors that are F6 or F5. 
Schmidt casting grants provide higher magnification because they're usually F8 or F10. And some of them can be F12 or F15, such as the old Ma Maxitov casting grain design. So they're great for the planets, the moon, and double stars, and brighter D space objects, but they have very narrow, constricted fields of view. Dobsonians have uh, large aperture, like I said, they're, we call them light buckets. They're ideal for galaxies, nebulas, uh, globular clusters, all kinds of really true deep space objects. So now coming to the question of field of view. Eyepieces are rated for their apparent field of view. But how much of the sky do you actually see? The 10 millimeter plossal in our example has an apparent field of view of 52, 52 degrees. The true field of view that you see through the eyepiece in your telescope is equal to its apparent field of view divided by the magnification. So in the sky watcher, the true field of view with that 10 millimeter plossal will be 0.57 degrees because the mag is 90 and the, the apparent field of view is 52. The full moon is half a degree. So through that eyepiece in the sky watcher, I just barely be able to see the entirety of the full moon. In a 90, my little 90 millimeter uh, acromat, the true field of view would be almost 0.8 degrees, almost four fifths of, of a degree. In the eight and 10 inch Dobsonians, the true field of view would be 0.43 degrees because of their greater mag. So you wouldn't be able to see the entire full moon in either one. Uh, in the LS8, that light switch, because it was very high mag, you have basically a quarter degree. You would only see half the full moon. And in the 16 inch, your true field of view would be just under 0.3 degrees and be just over a quarter if you're using a coma corrector. And I, I always use the coma corrector in my 16 inch. It just makes it life so much better. So we're gonna keep talking about field of view. Here's another eyepiece. It's also a 10 millimeter eyepiece, by the way. It's a Mead uh, mega wide angle eyepiece, 10 millimeter, but it has a 100 degree apparent field of view. So in my, I've never used this in my little acromat, but if I did, it would give me almost a, a degree and a half of true field of view. Uh, and the sky watcher would give me just over a degree, 100 divided by 90 is 1.11. In the Orion 8 and 10, it would have given me 0.83 degrees. In the Mead, it would have given me half a degree, so I could just barely see the full moon. In the 16, it would give me, with the coma corrector, half a degree. See, the reason for this is the magnifications haven't changed at all. This uh, very expensive 10 millimeter Mead, uh, which costs a couple hundred dollars, as opposed to the 30 or $40 dollar 10, millimeter, 10 millimeter plossal, the magnifications are exactly the same. The wide field of view is accomplished because the Mead has more lens elements inside the eyepiece. The plossal has four. The ultra wide Mead has eight separate lens elements inside the eyepiece. So the only difference is the apparent is the field of view. You get a bigger field of view with the Mead, but things aren't any bigger. They can't be because the magnification hasn't changed from the plossal. The Mead might be a little bit brighter due to a higher quality of glass being used, but that's a manufacturing issue. It's not something that's inherent to the design. The Mead also might be slightly sharper than the plossal, but the plossals are known to be quite sharp. So uh, the difference between the Mead, the Mead and the Sirius plossal is uh, the number of lens elements and the field of view, not the magnification because the focal length of your eyepiece is 10 millimeters either way. So now comes the topic of exit pupil. The human eye is at best has a pupil seven millimeters wide for young adults. Kids can have an eight millimeter pupil. Your pupils shrink with age. Most middle-aged adults have pupils that max out at five millimeters. I, I like to think that I still have seven. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I, I like to think that I still have seven. So what, is, what does it mean? When light comes out of the telescope eyepiece, it enters your eyes, your eye, I'm sorry, through the pupil. And the cone of light coming out of the eyepiece, okay, as seen here, when the light comes out of the eyepiece, it, uh, the distance between those rays of light, the total 
the total uh, what we call the light cone, it can't be more than seven millimeters or else light is wasted, detail is lost. And in reflectors and schmidt cassegrains grains, the shadow of that secondary mirror, which normally you don't see, would create a dark spot right in the middle of your field of view. Now with refractors, you can go over seven millimeters. Thing is, you won't, uh, you'll get a bigger field of view to the lower mag, but it actually won't be any brighter because if your eye can only hold seven millimeters of light, okay, then having an exit pupil of eight or nine millimeters, which is theoretically brighter, your eyes can't see those last, last, last one or two millimeters. So it won't look any brighter. You will however have a, a wider field of view. So exit pupil is aperture of the scope divided by the mag. Okay, the, the field of view apparent, the apparent field of view from the eyepiece is not important. So we're assuming a 10 millimeter eyepiece. And again, this would be the same in either that, that mead ultra wide or that basic serious plossal. In the Skywatcher, your exit pupil is 1.33 millimeters, which makes things dim but visible. In the 90 millimeter star blast, the little maroon scope, be a tad brighter. In the eight inch, it'd be a little bit better because you have bigger aperture. Uh, aperture is 203, the mag is 120. In the 10 inch, you have a 2.11 millimeter exit pupil. Even though the 10 inch and the eight inch have the same focal length and the same mag with any given eyepiece, the 10 inch always has a bigger exit pupil and always has a brighter image because it has greater aperture, okay? Now in that Mead light switch, that schmidt cassegrain the exit pupil will only be 1.02 millimeters. That can be tough. That's gonna create an image that's dim, uh, very hard to see. It can, be, it can be very hard to see, especially on a light polluted night or a cloudy night. When you compare the eight inch Orion, the daub with the eight inch schmidt cas uh, two scopes of the same aperture because they're both eight inch aperture, the faster scope, the Orion, has a bigger exit pupil and produces a brighter image, okay? So in my 16 inch, uh, I get two, over two millimeters, even with a coma corrector. And that's because aperture rules. Now, here's a dra dramatization of the difference between uh, Plossal eyepieces and ultra wide eyepieces. This is M M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, supposedly looking like that in the Sirius Plossal, and supposedly looking like this in an 82 degree, which is a common wide angle eyepiece. This is a bit exaggerated. In my experience, in a 52 degree eyepiece, unless it's low mag, say 20, 25 millimeters, you don't see M31, M32, and M110 all in the same field of view. Uh, you would need an 82 or 100 degree eyepiece uh, at medium focal length, say 20, 25 millimeters to comfortably see them all in the same field of view. But this gives you a dramatization and an idea that even at the same mag, notice how the galaxies aren't any bigger from one to the other. It's just your apparent field of view and, and indeed your actual field of view because your actual field of view or true field of view is determined by the apparent field of view of the eyepiece. So eyepieces have either one inch and a quarter or two inch barrels. The two inch eyepieces are generally longer from 27 to 55 millimeters and are intended to give wide field of views. Both the Sirius Plossal 10 millimeter and the Mead ultra wide 10 millimeter have inch and a quarter barrels. So think back to those images. Ryan Dobsonians, they always give you Sirius Plossals that come with it. They're pretty sharp. They have a 52 degree apparent field, inch and a quarter barrels. They're reasonably priced. Uh, there are some 60 degree eyepieces like called Astrotech Paradigm or Celestron XL LX, Agena Star Guider. Uh, they're a little bit more, 60 to 75 each. They're all inch and a quarter. They have a 60 degree field of view, which is noticeable. They, it's a more comfortable image and they're still pretty sharp and crisp. So they're worth upgrading to if you have the scratch. My favorite eyepieces are 68 degree field of view. Orion makes them. Uh, the Teleview Pan Optics are 68, but very pricey. The 
Bader Hyperions are 68, and the Stratuses are basically clones of the Bader Hyperions. They're hybrids. Uh, they can work in both inch and a quarter and two inch focusers, although I have better luck in one inch and a quarter focusers, and they're pretty sharp. This is basically my favorite eyepiece. Uh, it's my 13 millimeter Orion Stratus, 68 degree inch and a quarter eyepiece. I have had so many good times with this eyepiece, and even though I've moved to higher mag 82 to 100 degree eyepieces, I still break this one out once in a while for sentimental reasons. It's, uh, I've just, I've seen many things in the universe for the first time, at least for me, through this. This is a two inch barrel eyepiece. It's a 26 millimeter, 70 degree apparent field of view. It's good if you want to look at the Pleiades or, or large open clusters, or in a smaller scope, you, you can see M31, 32, and 110 at the same time, or M81 and, and M82 in the same field of view. Uh, not so crisp at the edges. That is the drawback of some of these wide angle designs, except for the very, very expensive ones like Televues or some of the higher end Explore Scientific eyepieces. Very hard to get an ultra wide uh, eyepiece that's crisp all across the field in, in a Newtonian. So just save your time and get these. Uh, for those of you who might have trouble seeing the image, that's a complete set of Teleview Ethos eyepieces. Uh, they're all 100 degree apparent field of view, except for the uh, 3.7 and 4.7, which are 110 degree apparent field of view. And each one costs more than an entire Orion XT8 telescope. And I believe the largest, the 21 millimeter Ethos, retails for about a, almost $1,000. Uh, but when, once you look through them, you'll understand why. So there's so much more observing to do, and I can't wait to get back to it. This has been a bum year uh, for obvious reasons. So welcome to the world of telescopes. That was great. <laughs>